Welcome back to our learning course. This is our first class on the Roscoe and Wagner model, an influential theory of Pavlovian conditioning. In this lesson, we will have a first look at the model. The model is an important part of this course, and it will return in many other lessons. To be brief, I will often say just RW rather than the Roscoe and Wagner model. Before explaining the model, let's see why it matters. RW was published in 1972 by experimental psychologists Robert A. Rescorla and Alan R. Wagner. Since then, it has been mentioned in more than 9,000 scientific publications. If you do the math, it means an average of a mention every other day for almost 50 years. There are three main reasons for this popularity. First, it was the first theory of learning that worked correctly when animals could learn about more than one stimulus. Second, RW is easy to understand yet powerful enough to be relevant to real-world learning, for example, in the treatment of addiction. Third, even if it is not perfect, it can be improved, and it remains an important starting point for most modern learning theories. Eventually, we will use RW to understand rather complex learning phenomena, but in this lesson we will talk only about the simplest Pavlovian experiment. In notation, this is simply A+. Plus that is the reinforced presentation of some stimulus A. As we know from earlier lessons, Pavlovian conditioning leads to the appearance of one or more conditioned responses, or CRs, in response to the stimulus A. The first thing we want to explain is exactly how the CR increases with repeated CSUS experiences. This will demonstrate an important learning principle that will help us understand more complex cases. As we can see from this data on RAT magazine entry, learning is fast at the beginning, and then it slows down until eventually some maximum level of responding is reached. This is the pattern that we want to explain, a steep rise at the beginning of learning and the leveling off later. For completeness, I should mention that sometimes there is a period of slower learning at the beginning, before the speed picks up. We will deal with this in a later lesson. Before talking about how RW learns, let's say something about what it learns. We saw in an earlier lesson that Pavlovian conditioning could actually mean a couple of different things. It could mean the learning of a CS-US association, of a CS-R association, or of both. RW assumes that Pavlovian conditioning depends on the growth of a CS-US association. The CR is assumed to be an automatic consequence of the growth of this association. This is an assumption we will discuss more in depth in a future lesson. For now, just remember that in RW, learning is described as the growth of a CS-US association. RW describes this association with a number, the associative strength, V, that can be zero, positive, or negative. Zero means that there is no association. The animal does not consider the CS and US related at all. This is the typical state of affairs when we start a conditioning experiment. The dog does not salivate, the rabbit does not blink, the pigeon does not peck, and so on. All of these things are described by saying that the CS-US associative strength is zero. When a conditioned response has been learned, RW assumes that the associative strength has grown to a positive number. The goal of the model is to describe this growth and understand the principle that underline the change of associative strength. The associative strength can also be negative, but we will talk about this in a future lesson. Now, let's see how learning proceeds. We will use words before we go into the math of the model. If you think about it, learning exists because animals make mistakes. The first time Pavlov's dog hears the bell, it will not salivate. When the meat comes, the dog's mouth is dry, and it has to either wait or chew uncomfortably. In this sense, not salivating when hearing the bell is a mistake. Learning is there to fix this mistake. To fix a mistake, we must first know that we are wrong. When you make a mistake, it means that what you do and what you should do are not the same. We call this difference the error. Here it is written as a mock equation, but we will soon turn this into a real mathematical equation. To help you remember how things work, I call the term what you should do the wise, and the what you really do term the weird. 
I came up with these so you won't find them elsewhere. I'm not necessarily proud of them, but I hope they are helpful. Wise is supposed to sound like wise, like in you have wised up. The wise is the best behavior you could possibly do. Weird sounds like weird in the sense that before you learn, you do something different from what you should be doing. So each time a CS-US experience happens, RW calculates an error that is the difference between the wise and the weird. RW then uses a fraction of this error to learn. By a fraction, I mean something like 5%, 10%, or something like that. What this means exactly, we will see in a minute. For now, keep in mind that a single learning experience rarely corrects the error fully. It takes time to learn. Let's look now at how the statement learning is a fraction of the error translates into math. It's pretty much a literal translation. We just have to change words into symbols. These are the symbols that we will use. There's a bunch of Greek letters that we use out of tradition. That is because everyone uses them. We have a symbol for the stimulus that is being experienced, which is simply A, a symbol for the associative strength of the stimulus, VA, a symbol for how much the associative strength changes with the learning experience, which is delta VA, and then we have two terms for the wise and the weird. The wise is called lambda. We will see how that is used in a couple of minutes. And the weird is VA. This simply reflects the assumption that what you do depends on your associative strength. The symbols are assembled into the learning equation like this. The first term is delta V, the change in associative strength. This is equal to the error lambda minus V, that is, wise minus weird, times the factor gamma. Here is what this means. As I mentioned earlier, the symbols pretty much translate the sentence learning is proportional to error. Learning is delta V, how much the associative strength changes. This is what RW would like to calculate. The word is translates into the equals symbol. The word proportional to translates into a multiplication by the number gamma. Finally, the error is the difference between the wise and the weird. When we use the RW model, this equation is applied at every CS-US experience, over and over again. We will see now how this leads to learning. Let's say that lambda is 100 and gamma is 0.2. We want to track learning starting from an initial value of V equals zero, that is, no association between the CS and the US. At every step, we want to calculate the change in associative strength, gamma times lambda minus V. To help us, we track things on this graph. We start from zero as our associative strength V, and we apply the rescorle wagner learning equation with lambda equal 100 and gamma equal uh, 0.2. The first thing to note is that at the beginning, the error is 100. Lambda is 100, V is zero, so lambda minus V is 100. So according to the rescorle wagner model, the change in associative strength will be 0.2 times 100, that is 20. This means that according to the model, after the first CS-US experience, the associative strength will jump from zero to 20. At this point, the error is 80. If we redo the calculations, we have 0.2 times 80 equals 16, which means that the associative strength V will jump by another 16 units. And so our total for now is 36. We can repeat this another time. When we are at 36, the error is 64 which means that according to the model, the associative strength is going to increase another 12.8 units for a total of 48.8. At this point, the numbers start to get ugly, but the procedure is always the same. We can track V, our associative strength, at each experience of the CS paired with the US. We can do this a number of times, like this, and as you can see, at each step, the error gets smaller, which means that the change in V also gets smaller because it's proportional to the error. 
This gives the RW learning curve its characteristic appearance of starting fast and then slowing down. We saw earlier that this is fairly typical of Pavlovian conditioning, and it's one of the things that we would like to understand. When will learning stop? In the RW model, the only way for delta V to be zero, that is for there being no further change in associated strength, is for the error to be zero. That means that what you should do must be the same as what you actually do. In other words, learning continues until it has gotten rid of all of the error. This is why the RW learning rule is called an error correction learning rule. In our example, if you continue long enough, you will see V grow closer and closer to the lambda value of 100 that we have been using. Doing all the calculations is tedious, but fortunately we can program computers to do them for us. The most important question is, does this work? Can we really understand how animals learn with the Roscoe and Wagner equation? The short answer is that RW is not a perfect model, as I said at the beginning of the lesson, but it has helped us tremendously to understand learning. We will explore all of its pros and cons in the coming lessons. Here is just one example. This is the same graph we saw at the beginning of the lesson, the graph that I used as an example of the kind of results we would like to explain with a learning model. And this is the best fit of the Roscoe and Wagner model to the uh, data point. It matches the actual behavior pretty well, as you can see. When I say best fit, I mean that I have programmed my laptop to find the values of lambda and gamma that make the RW prediction as close as possible to the real data. This is something that computers can do easily, saves us a lot of time, and enables us to validate or evaluate the model. I have broken down the discussion of the Roscoe and Wagner model in a few lessons to make it more digestible. I know by experience that this is the hardest part of the course for most students. I also know that you can definitely understand the model and see how it contributes to our understanding of learning. We will continue this discussion in the coming lessons. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone.